Welcome to Aspects of Writing. I'm your host, James Kelly, and my co-host is Janet Corsi. The topic of today's show is the pros and cons of collaboration part two. Our guests for the show are Lance T- Talbot, <laughs> Chris Keaton, and Rick Talbot. Uh, before we get to our guests, my panel and I would like to read a few fun quips and quotes. And Jan, I'm going to let you start. Oh, I'd love to. Writing is like sausage making, in my view. You'll be happier in the end if you just eat the product without knowing what's gone into it. That's so and true. That's, and that's George R. R. Martin. Ah, uh-huh, Game of Thrones, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yes. All right, I have a writer's block. When your imaginary friends stop talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and that is by Anonymous. Yes. And Chris. Uh, editing is like killing your story and then slowly bringing it back to life. <laughs> With magic, I would say. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and Rick? Respect your parents. They passed school without Google. Despicable minions. <laughs> minions, minions quote. Boy, is that ever true today. Right. <laughs> and mine is also a, a quote by George R. R. Martin. Uh, during an interview with the Game of Thrones writer, uh, director, producer, George R. R. Martin, a uh, reporter asked, there's one thing that really interesting about your books. I noticed that you write women really well and really different. Where does that come from? And George R.R. R. Martin <laughs> thought for a moment and said, you know, I've always considered women to be people. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank goodness. That's yeah. great. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to Aspects of Writing <laughs> with me, your host, James Kelly. I think my name is James. <laughs> and <laughs> my co-host, Janet Corsi. Our guests are Lance Talbolt, Chris Keaton, and Rick Talbolt. Uh, The topic of today's show is the pros and cons of collaboration part two. We're picking up where we left left off last week. Sure we are. Sure we are. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, Our first guest is Chris Keaton. And Chris, please give us some idea about who you are and what you have accomplished. Uh, Well, it depends on how everyone you ask. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I started uh, thinking about writing many, many moons ago. Uh Uh, I was in in the service. Uh, and never really translated that thought to action until uh, many years later. But I started with screenplays because I, I love the movie industry, so I worked on that for a while. After getting some short films made and some features optioned, I thought I would expand my horizons and have people actually wanted to read my material. So I moved into prose, and that's where I met Rick, and we started down this path with the uh, mosaic. Yeah, and as we discussed last show... It- it was a seven-year collaboration, <laughs> so that's why we're really going to really delve more into this. And also, please tell us about Mosaic. I know you did last week as well, but you know we want we want our listeners to understand what you your latest work is. All right. Well, here's the here's the great elevator pitch I got for it. Okay. Good. Uh, <laughs> when twin girls discover a mystical world contained within a crumbling mosaic, they must restore it before an evil witch seizes its power, even if it means tearing their family apart. Okay. I'll tell you. I like that. It's good. Yeah. Now, now Chris, I, I, I may want to steal one of your little mosaics for my book, but anyhow, where where can we learn more about you in particular? What's your website? Oh, I have, I have a website, chris-keaton.com. Uh-huh. Uh, the mosaic novel.com as well will take you there. Uh, I have a Facebook fan page, which the, the URL is way too long for that, but I'm sure that'll be on the website somewhere. Good. I, and all of my books uh, are available on Amazon right now. Marvelous. Just about everywhere. Marvelous. All right. If you are just tuning in, you are listening to Aspects of Writing with me, your host, James Kelly, and my co-host is Janet Corsi. Our guests are Lance Tobalt. I'm sorry. Talbolt. Talbolt. <laughs> there you go. Chris <laughs> Keaton and Rick Talbolt. The topic of today's show is the pros and cons of collaboration part two. All righty. Well, you just took my line from me. So our next guest is Lance <laughs> Talbold. Lance, please tell us about yourself and what your latest book is, what you're up to. Okay. Well, um, I'm originally an entertainer. I still am. So that's my background. Everything from uh, Metropolitan Opera, Broadway. Uh, uh, and then I was in soap opera, actually. I was on General Hospital for five years. I remember. Ah, good. Good. Yes. So do a lot of people, actually. It's crazy. Yep. Yep. And uh, 
I got into writing almost by accident. I've always been a big reader. And a friend of mine knew that I kind of dabbled at writing and asked me to write for a um, magazine that was here in uh, Las Vegas called Envy Man Magazine. And they wanted it to be a little different. And um, uh, they wanted some fiction for it. So I wrote a story for it. And they got great response on it. And they said, we want more. And I went, oh, this is fun. So uh, that's where it started out. And um, then my uh, partner, Rich Devon, was working on a book called Ripper, A Love Story, which is the title it finally turned out to be. Yeah. And uh, I said, you know, I'd like to work on that with you. He goes, well, okay. So we started working on it and became Ripper, A Love Story. And uh, that was it. And several books later, I'm going to say I'm in 14 books right now. Wow. Either have Man, stories in them or or... or collaborations or, or solo titles. So the newest one um, I'm working on now is a, uh, a series called The Dare Girls, D-A-R-E. Ooh. Yes. Well, what's that about? Well, it's about um, a sorority, and uh, it is the most elite sorority there is. Uh, it's Delta, Alpha, Rho, Epsilon. And there are four letters. Normally they have three. Uh -huh. And why do they have four? Yes. Because they can Oh yes. yes. So and uh, it's a very uh, erotic in nature, actually. Okay. You know, there are yes, there are many requirements to get into the sorority. So uh, I'd be surprised yeah. if it wasn't. Yes. So that's <laughs> what that's what it is. It's a yeah. So it's a. I'd say it's for the the young adults, the new adults. Okay. Where can we learn more about Lance uh, Talbot <laughs> <laughs> on Facebook, or you can uh, check out my. Uh, on my author central page on Barnes and Noble and Amazon, uh, so that's where you can find and out about me. And sixteen thirty books and thirteen thirty books. Thir 13. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. on the website thirteen thirty <laughs> books. Yes, I, uh, I'm going to make a recommendation to you, Lance. Though, yes, on your Facebook, you need to to have a little clip there of you singing because, oh my gosh, can this man built it out? He's just marvelous. Thank you, and that's a good idea. I'm go I am going to do that. Thanks Pl for that, Jay. Please do. So yes. I, I'm curious, how did you name 1330 Books? Where did that come from? The two original founders of the company's birthdays are the, on the 13th oh. and the 30th. Oh, oh okay. Wow, well, that makes sense then. I mm -hmm. thought it was some mystery about I would I would be the, the I would be the 13, by yeah. the way. Oh. Yes, yeah. <laughs> September 13th, so it's coming yeah. up a couple of weeks. Oh, oh right. that was wow. my brother's birthday. Yeah. Wow. Well, our third guest is Rick Talbot. Uh, Rick, please tell us about yourself and the experience, your experiences as a writer. Well, I've uh, been writing, oh, since the early 90s, although when I was in high school, I'd write some short stories and things like that, and then I kind of got into it seriously, you know, like I say, in the early 90s, writing my first novel, and just as I went along, had a bunch of characters, and, and then in 2004, I managed to get the book published. Three years later, it was out of print. I had it republished through another publisher. Um, then I took that back and gave it over to 1330 Books, where it is now available. And along the way, I'd written a couple other novels, which I've taken out of print, want to redo. And my most recent endeavor, before Mosaic, is a punctuation for fiction writers, a nonfiction book that is aimed right at uh, at fiction writers and all the things that they run into with punctuation, especially punctuating dialogue. So I geared it, because there's no other book out there like it. So I said, fiction writers need a book on punctuation for fiction writers. Hmm. Okay. It yeah. sits right next to me on my desk when I am writing. It is invaluable. Oh, yeah. God, <laughs> I could have used it. <laughs> all right. So can, what can you tell us a little bit about the book you worked on with Chris? Um, for Mosaic? Well, I, as Chris said last time, we got, uh, you know, we kind of met on the internet through a third party, and that's where the collaboration began. Uh, Chris being a screenwriter and me being a novel writer, we decided that I would take over the writing of it, and that way we would have all the consistency, whereas I was going from his screenplay and his ideas, so I was actually doing the actual writing, and then later on as we got into revisions, he would go through and do things, and I would come back through and, well, 
I won't say clean them up, but just make them consistent so the voice all sounded consistent, which I guess is what we're going to be talking about shortly. Yeah. And um, it's it's been a great great working together with Chris because we we share the vision, and that's what you need to do in a collaboration. You both need to see it as a single vision, not fighting each other, saying, "Well, I want this, I want that." You know, you have you have to see it together. Yeah. And we did, and that's why it's worked out for us. Well, last week we talked about um, what it was like collaborating on the book, um, but we didn't have time to finish up with our questions. Um, so we're going to pick up where we left off, and I'm going to start with, we covered the pros and cons about collaboration and, and discussed a few of the issues. Then we ran out of time. I'd like to pick up where we left off because I feel it's important for anyone thinking about writing a collaboration to understand that collaborating is a lot of work in order to get it right. So, Rick, I'm going to let you start with, we pick up with number five. Okay. Well, ideally, the tone and voice of a book should be fairly even. If a collaborator writes one chapter or many, can you have the tone match yours well enough so it fits? Do you need someone to help the two of you match tone? Mm -hmm. Alternating voices may work if you alternate chapters, but only if your collaborator only writes two. It may just feel clunky unless the tone and voice match. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. So, Chris, I assume that you created the voice for the book, correct? Well, I think it helped because we had the the screenplay was there from start to finish. Uh -huh. So that laid out the tone for the story and, and all that jazz. So that was there to keep us on track. And I think, though, know, it helped because once Rick took it from the screenplay to the page, we were all intermingling our updates throughout the book. So you didn't have a whole chapter that might have been in a different voice. Mm -hmm. And so it was easier to massage that and make sure it's uh, sure it pretty consistent. So did, let me just ask this, let's say with going with the first chapter, did you lay out the first chapter for Rick to go over, or did Rick take the script and lay it out for you? Right, well, Rick took the script and started from there. Okay. Pretty much from start to finish. Now, he would give me pieces, and then I would go through and adjust here or there and then send it back. But that's pretty much how he worked through the whole thing. It wasn't a chapter here or a chapter there. I'm thinking that might... I don't, I don't like the idea of a chapter there or chapter there between two different people because it would be very hard to keep it consistent. Now, if you were doing, like, point of view, so one writer wrote one point of view and the other one wrote the other point of view it would probably be a lot easier to keep consistent and actually sound good if you did have some differences. Yeah, yeah, because I know that we have, we've we've had a couple of people who collaborate on books, and I know, Lance, you have as well. Some, oftentimes, um, you're collaborating in, in a way that you're, if you're, especially if you're doing a memoir, that someone's handing you their notes and you're helping create it from those notes. And then oftentimes, as with what I know... Um, Rich and, and Jeff had said to the authors at Ron, they they actually would sit side by side and try and figure it out sometimes, you know, what direction to go in. What, Lance, do you find easier to do when it comes to collaborating? They both have their pros and cons. Uh, actually, Rich and I, when we wrote uh, Ripper, A Love Story, we did the sit side by side mm -hmm. type of thing. Uh, we had an, uh, there was an outline, uh, outline chapters actually is what we worked from originally. He did uh, the bulk of that. And then... Uh, so that it would, so the tone was set for it, and then uh, we would, li we were literally would sit side by side and go through chapters, or, and, uh, but uh, as far uh, to keep it uh, to keep it consistent, it's it's really the only way you could, you've got to stay on it on top of it. Well, when you also are collaborating with Heather Graham, mm -hmm. how are you guys doing that? Well, I'm uh, actually uh, I'm starting it, and I and I know her books so well having read so many of them yeah. so I've got her style she even said she said I probably know how she writes better than she does <laughs> which was nice but uh, so I'm going to try and keep in her style and then I'll I'll turn things over to her and she can tweak and do things with it and add her and add her own things I think that's that's the way we're we're doing it okay all right well consistency is the next um, number six issue uh, it may feel odd to readers if the chapters are too different from each other, can you match the structure of the chapters? Well, readers feel feel thrown to suddenly read a, a chapter by someone else. 
they feel thrown if they're if they're reading a chapter by someone else, which we just Rick, I think you had just mentioned that. Um, or will it be refreshing and instill confidence to read the chapter by an expert on the chapter subject? Explore the reader's experience by asking some potential readers. Uh, that's another thing. Rick and Chris, did you ask anyone to read what you had written as you were going along to see what direction you wanted to go in? Well, we use beta readers for sure, and that's what... I mean, yeah, I think you have to in the screenwriting world. Oh, we live or die on getting reviews and help from other writers because they're a lot easier to go through. So a novel, it's a lot harder to hand over someone and say, hey, give me your feedback real quick because it's going to take forever to go through it. But once we were done with the first pass, we did have people read it, and it pointed out weaknesses and where we had to, had to uh, make some corrections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Well, the liability, and, and this is something that would you really got to pay attention to. What if your co-author uh, plagiarizes? That can be really a scary thing for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What if they do something that compromises the book project legally? Be sure to do your homework on this person before collaborating. Do a Google search on them. Ask colleagues about them. Also, have you... Uh, have your collaborator met with trusted friends of yours or colleagues of yours to see if there's any red flags that they pick up on. Uh, listen to them if they do. Even if you're excited about a potential collaborator, they may see or hear something you don't, and, and you've got to be very careful. Yeah, so, Chris, you're the one who sought out Rick. <laughs> did you do any? Did you go online and check Rick out, or...? I had a I had an online friend at the time that that really recommended him because uh, you know yeah you don't want to get in a relationship with someone that you know you, you have any red flags with because as you as we found it could be a seven year relationship and it might be hard to do uh, so yeah we I checked him out I read his work talked to him a bit and and I'm sure he did the same thing uh, for me before we really got into this in earnest. Now, of course, having that contract, I think I mentioned in the last conversation, helps because it is still also a business relationship. Yeah. So we nailed out who owns what, how things are split, and uh, and definitely there was a clause in there that you know even if the relationship breaks and we stop here, neither of us would do anything that would harm the property. Yeah. That's a great idea. Yeah, I think the whole idea behind the Google search was to make sure someone's not a mass murderer that you're going into collaboration with <laughs> or something like that. But if you're writing a really good murder thriller. <laughs> yeah. If they're writing their life story. Maybe. You know? yeah. All right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you got right. the right guy. Uh, Chris, I'm going to let you take the next one. Right now, uh, it's a joy to own something with someone, whether it be a home, boat, or book. Some might disagree. Uh, but what happens if things go sour? What insurances can you put in place to assure that everything goes in the right direction? Yeah. Well, your contract, I think, is one of the, the main features of that. It's like a marriage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But even with a contract, things can still mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, go the, all right. Yeah. They can. The yeah, yeah. contract does nothing really other than make things clear to both parties at sign it so that at least there's some understanding there. Yeah. And maybe there will be some legal foothold if things do go really wrong. Uh, but I think just having it there is, is it lays out what your relationship is on paper, and you know where both parties stand, so it stops any kind of confusion later on or conflict. Mm -hmm. so yeah. always get those contracts. And Lance, I'm not sure how many authors you have. I know you've dealt with several, and I know you've you know had your own things with authors. I have had in the past with contracts with authors that anyone can get out of a contract with a 30-day written notice on either side, you know. And I don't, you know, to me that's so easy and so simple to do because there are times when someone thinks, well, maybe you're not going in the right direction for me the way I want to go, um, and maybe I can do it better. If someone feels that way, I feel let them go, let them see what they can do. You know why not? I agree. I agree totally with you. Yeah, we, yeah. we their, our company works that way. They we don't have they have ownership of their project. Right. If they want to take it, and they can do something else with it, or they get offered you know a contract with a big publishing company for it. I good luck to that. I mean yeah, it's I it's could. wonderful. So it's 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 good to, like you said to have. The clauses in there like that to make it simple. If you really just want out, then just send a letter and say, okay. 
<laughs> no problem. Yeah. All right, Lance, I'm going to let you take the next one. What responsibility does the publisher have to ensure a smooth transition from writing the book into promoting the book? Well, uh, my feeling is, is why would you take on a book unless you wanted it to sell? As a publisher, you, you see the potential there, so you would work with the author and say, this is what we're going to do and what we're, and, uh, what we're willing to do. Uh, what can you do? Do you have any ideas? So it's, again, a collaboration between, it should be, I think, between the publisher and the writer. Well, I think we talked about that, too, on the last show, in that, um, you know, even with the major, the traditional publishing houses now, you have to do a lot of legwork. You're, you're expected to go out there and do your best to... Not necessarily set up the book signings if that's what you're going to do, but you know you need to go out there and definitely do your part in doing those book signings. And they're not going to hold your hand and, and walk you through it. No, you right. know you no. have to go out there and present yourself. And and I think that's something that it's really a misnomer. People think automatically someone publishes you, whether large or small. Okay, now I just have to show up. No, right? No, no, no you, not at all. You know, and I don't know how you handle the authors you're with, but I've handled authors in the past, sometimes they're financially strapped, for instance, because it takes a lot of money to go out there and do this. So anyone who thinks that it doesn't take money, they're kidding themselves. You right. Know? You do have to spend money to travel, to stay somewhere, to eat while you're there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, those are essential. So it is tax deductible, however, so <laughs> there is that. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, you have to consider all of that when you're going into this, and that's part of your responsibility as far as collaborating with the publisher. Yes. And if you're an author, you've got to be willing to go to those places. You can't just sit at home and say, well, you know, either my book sells or it doesn't. It doesn't work that way. If you don't go, it doesn't sell. Yeah. That's true. That's very true. And, you know, I know know that, um, Rick, you came out to Vegas, and I know, Chris, you came up to Vegas from Arizona. Um, So, obviously, (laughs) Rick incurred the the biggest expense because he had the furthest to go. Um, but I know that when you start, I hope that when you start your, your book signings in the future, you won't just be jumping all over the place. One of the things I see, and this is, I'm going to mention this because I think it's important. One of the things I, I try to do is with authors, or I have in the past, is start with a region. Stay within that region and, and work your way into the bookstores if you're going to go out and do signings. Because yes. it's not going to cost you as much to travel if you have a route that I call it a route. Where, you know, you go to this city, then the next city, then the next city. And, and you can build your base there. I also try to set up um, book signings with um, independent stores that are on, on consignment. Because usually on a consignment, they'll pay you when the event's over or within a few weeks anyway. So that helps give you more money to continue along the, the, the way. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But if you're flying to New York, and then you're flying to L.A., and then you're flying to Dallas, Texas, and then you're flying to Atlanta, Georgia, you're spending a lot of money that you will never recoup because we all know that in this world of book signings, <laughs> yes. you know, you're not going to sell 100 or 200 books each time you go. Right. And that's what you would have to do in order to sustain. Yeah, no, a- Absolutely. So, Chris and Rick, this is for you. Do you have any kind of a plan when it comes to to book signings? Uh, well, you know, I'm this is my first book, really. So, and uh, first publisher. Mm-hmm. So, I'm hoping to learn from uh, Lance and Gang at thirteen thirty uh-huh. on what best. Now, I know web promotion and getting reviews and all that jazz, but beyond that, you know, I'm a I'm a student. Okay. And Lance, you do a lot of signings locally. Yes, yes, I do. Um, just to, you want to get your face out there every time you've got, got a, another book out, you want to get that out there. And to keep your backlist going, too. Yeah. I find that still sells as much because they're new books right, they want to, to see those what other else people. Yeah. As well as the, yes, that's exactly what they do. They always want to know what else you have. And I think the other thing that's very important for authors, besides just the signings in the stores... Conventions. Look, uh, look yeah. to conventions because they're ones geared they're toward whatever genre you are writing in. And that's how you meet other people. Uh, you get your name out there. People are reading you. Uh, other authors are talking about you. Uh, you're, get, you're getting your network going. And uh, you never know when these people are going to be invaluable to you. And you can uh, maybe for an, a collaboration. I've seen that happen so many times at conventions. People will leave a convention, and they're working on a book with somebody they just met. Right. It's it's so, so interesting, and I think it's invaluable to get out there. 
and you called it networking is extraordinarily important. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I, I'm just curious, though, when you say conventions, I mean, I, I've been to a couple you've been to. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes you've got to be very careful, too, if, if you're going to go to this convention. You have to be very realistic about because you have to pay for a table oftentimes. Yes. So you have to be realistic that if you're going to do that, you have to be one of those type people who can sell. <laughs> You know, you have to be willing to draw them to your t- table because you have a lot of competition at, at those conventions. You do. You do. Absolutely. Uh, e- even if you can get someone that knows your book and knows how to sell, bring them with you because that is – it's crucial. It's yeah. crucial. And I see at so many of these conventions, people sit there. They're not outgoing personalities. They sit behind the table, and they just wait for people to walk up to them. And Doesn't you can't happen. do that. Doesn't happen. I have never sat at a signing. I'm always standing in front of the table, just bringing them in, and it works wonderfully for me. Maxwell Alexander Drake was on the show about four years ago, <laughs> and he does phenomenal at these events. And one of the reasons – we talked about this on the show even – is one of the reasons he does so well is that he's not one of those people who's shy – who's just sitting there crocheting or texting on the phone. You know, he's standing up, he's running out there, have you seen my new latest book? <laughs> Here's my, and he puts yes. it in their hand for them to see it, you know. That's um, great. That's so, great. Yeah, but he's got that personality. So he always does well at those. But you certainly can't just sit behind the desk when you pay, uh, you know, a little bit of money for those. No, you're paying, you're paying for that table anywhere between, you know, $25. I've seen them as high as, you know, three or $400. Hundred, yeah. Yes. Yeah. But uh, there's nothing more off-putting, and I'm putting this out there, than seeing some, an author sit there and they're playing on their phone, not even looking up at their potential customers and their potential fans. It's, it's just horrible, horrible. I th- I actually, I think authors should just not even take their cell phones to the signings. Yeah, I know. You know, it, it, this is true for authors as much as it is for other industries. I worked in the food industry most of my life, and I, I also worked front desk at one hotel. And I remember one of the things they taught us was is that when you see a guest approaching from, you know, 10 yards, let's say, or coming down an escalator – Make eye contact mm-hmm. so that they'll come to you. You know, always that way. It's a friendly feeling. Well, it's the same way in the book industry. Absolutely. You know, you, there are probably forty, fifty people around you or in that room. But if the, the five people that are sitting next to you aren't looking at someone walking in your direction, they're probably not going to get their attention. But I promise you, if you look at them and you smile, they're going to come your direction. Yep. And of that's course. what you want to do. Of course. Yeah. Everybody wants to be welcomed. Well, absolutely. Yeah. All right, book coaching, Lisa Tenner at, at listener.com offers 17 questions to answer with a co-writer or collaborator before you get started. And we're going to talk about each one. And the first one is who is responsible for writing each chapter, section, etc. And it sounds like, Chris, you had mentioned that you gave the script to Rick. Rick kind of wrote the chapter, and then you would go back and critique it together. Yeah, it was basically like him out. I mean, the screenplay was the outline. With the new one, uh, I flew through and wrote, you know, a 40,000-word rough, really rough draft yeah. instead of going to the screenplay first because, you know, I knew it was just automatically going to be a sequel to The Mosaic. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. so now he has that, and he's working through it. And then we'll just toss it back and forth like we did the first one. Rick, have you collaborated on any other books? Yes, I actually did, and oddly enough, it was another fellow named Chris. <laughs> okay. Uh, this was the other Chris and I. Um, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 38. from uh, He had um, congestive heart failure. Oh. Mm-hmm. But we had met online, same venue where Chris and I connected, and he wanted to collaborate with someone on something, and but he wrote... Um, urban crime fiction, not my strength. I like vampires, so I suggested maybe there'd be a fit there. I sent him some ideas I'd had for vampire stories, and Uh he concocted pretty much the same way Chris did, an outline and characters. He gave me characters and the outline. I filled it in. I took the writing, and we produced two novels that way. But uh, I I want to redo them, unfortunately. They'll be dedicated to Chris, but we never finished the third one. But I want to go back over them and 
take what I had and do that. But that was my first collaboration. So in the, in the first collaboration with the other Chris, um, not Chris Keaton, but the other Chris, <laughs> um, which who wrote the, the, the chapters? Who wrote each section, you or the other Chris? I did all the writing on it. Okay. I did all the writing. He he basically gave me all the information, and it was set in Detroit, where I'd never been. So he gave me all the details, and we brought Detroit in as almost a character in the novel. Hmm. So that was his contribution. He could give me all those little details, and I just brought it to life for it. And I I thought we 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 worked very well together. So I was I was very sad when he passed away. I all right now. This is for everyone. Um, who is responsible for research? Who would like to take that? Lance? Um, actually, I think uh, both of you should be responsible for research because you, you'll probably both wind up finding out different things and uh, seeing what things will, will work for the book and uh, trying to testing them out with, with the, your collaborator. Yeah, and I was going to ask you, Chris, if, if, if you had, if, if let's just say, for instance, that um, Rick had something in there that you were uncertain of, did you, did you go online and check it out or? Well, I'm a I'm a, a beast for useless information, okay. so I, I pretty much like remember everything that I come across. Okay. So if there was anything sketchy, I would probably know and be able to go right and figure out right where I could find out about it. I mm-hmm. uh, and I like to throw. I mean, this is fantasy, so you can make everything up. But to be to pull your readers in, you have to be realistic in a lot of places. Yeah. So I pull like real geography and stuff in there. Or, just little tidbits of, of real life in there. So, yeah, anyone that's writing, though, you should be researching your stuff if you're going to pass it off as uh, reality. Yeah. Uh, if not, I someone is going to catch you on it. Yeah. yeah what, what, I'm sorry, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I'm anal when it comes to research and in details. Uh-huh. I want to be sure if I, if I say that, you know, my characters went to an Oh, you can eat buffet at a pizza hut in a <laughs> in a particular town that's a real town. I make sure that that Pizza Hut was, you know, within reasonable distance for them to walk to or whatever, so... Yeah. Yeah, if you look at uh, the pieces of the mosaic, uh, it's the companion novel or companion book to the mosaic, where each story is set in a different time frame. There was a lot of research in each one to find out what Indian tribes were in that region at the time, what kind of political strife was going on in the Mediterranean and that thing, who owned what... So there was a lot of research. Thankfully, Google is there for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> when I started writing, I'm just, I age myself every time I say this. <laughs> we didn't have the internet. <laughs> yeah. There was no internet to research all of this. And it's interesting because I've never been in the military, and my book is a government espionage. Um, and so I wrote all these things, and I thought, did I write anything that makes sense? Like, could these things really have happened? And does someone have the power to say, I need this or I'm going to? And it, I, I actually turned it over to a retired Air Force colonel to read because there was an actual colonel who was mentioned in the book. And he read it, and he said, to be honest with you, some of the things you had some of these generals and stuff doing, I don't even know if they could or couldn't do them, you know, because yeah. they had, do have a little bit more power than – we think, mm-hmm. you know, to commission things. So there are some things you can't always research. So if my advice for someone, if you're reading a fictional novel, is don't get too caught up in the, uh, you know, actual facts because it is just a fictional novel. Right. So, all right, who's responsible for providing ideas and content behind the book? We also all, we know already that Chris, you're the one who provided the the ideas and the content for Mosaic. Right, right, and uh, Rick added uh, added some extra flair to it because you know a, a screenplay lacks a lot of details because you don't need it for the screen, but for the novel you do. But Lance, in your case, because you've collaborated on books that you just decided you were going to write, mm-hmm. so who comes up with the ideas and the content? Uh, let's see. I have come up with the with ideas for some of them. The one with Heather, I came up with the idea for it. Uh, but the other, like Rich, came up with the idea for for Ripper. Okay, uh, I came up with the idea for On Two Fronts. So, oh, okay, it, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, that was an interesting book. Thank you. Um, 
And okay, so then how do we ensure an even tone um, that you both agree on? You know something that I found out, and if you have the luxury, uh, as Rich and I, when we, were, when we wrote Ripper, we would read it aloud. Yeah. Read the chapter aloud and, they say, oh, and then all of a sudden you're hearing something go, oh, that sounds clunky or awkward, or I don't think they would have used that word, or uh, things like that. It really yeah. helps to read things aloud. Even we, as a solo writer, it helps to read it aloud. Yeah, we talked about that when Rich was on the show. And, and I, I like to do it. I'll sit at home by myself and read out loud. Oh, sure. You know, I mean, I have two little dogs who sit there and listen to me, maybe. But, you know, uh, yeah, it, it really helps because does. you realize how clumsy, you know, a sentence is or, you know, like would they really have said that when you say it. So that does help. Mm -hmm. All right. If we disagree on content or wording, how do we um, reach consensus? Has that happened, Rick, with you and Chris? There have been a couple of times, you know, where we had to think about it. You know, I'd propose something, Chris would come back with a counter, and maybe I'd come back again. But, you know, I'm usually pretty easygoing if it, if it makes sense to me, and I think Chris is the same way. If it makes sense and we can justify it, which I always tried to do to him and he to me, then we go with it that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it makes sense and serves the book, that's really what you want. I found that... I, I, I can't necessarily say I've collaborated on books, but with the two memoirs I did, in a way, the, it was a collaboration because I did help f formulate those stories. Mm -hmm. And I remember where there was one where the author wasn't sure she wanted to include the beginning of their lives, like how she grew up and how her husband grew up. And because her life was different than his. He grew up very poor. And she grew up in, in you know, I, I guess you'd say middle-class family. And so they were trying to decide, well, should that even be in there? I thought his story was hilarious. I mean, this man put a twist on being poor like you would never believe. <laughs> there were stories about having no shoes. There were stories about getting these golf shoes. They had the... The With things the on the bottom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yep. walking down the classroom and the click, principal click, click, click. pulled him aside. Who's making that noise? And <laughs> no one, he didn't, he was like, I'm, I, he didn't want to admit he did. So he, the, the principal stood there until everyone walked by and realized it was him and grabbed him by the shirt and pulled him over. Come in here. Let's go to the office. <laughs> so, you know, there's some hilarious stories, this man. So I thought yeah. this could really add to the story a lot because you get to see who these people were leading up to the events of the story, which is very tragic actually oh. so i thought there has to be some humor here somewhere and that was one way of drawing the humor into the story mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. so, yeah so she listened to me on that one um, <laughs> <laughs> and how will we market the book and we did talk about that a few minutes ago about mm -hmm. yeah. you know the marketing do you have any marketing plan for mosaic um lance as uh, we're, we're yes of course uh we're, we're still discussing and uh because we've gotten some input from chris and rick and uh some things that we can do with that. So that's a collaboration in itself is making sure you speak it with is. both authors. It is. I think it should be. With, yeah, uh, I agree. Unfortunately, when you're with the, the big publishers, they're pretty hard and fast. They're going to do what they're going to do. And well, because they think they have a tried and true method, yes. and so that's what they want to go with. Mm -hmm. And plus they have connections to get them into the stores. You know, whereas when you're self-published or a smaller publisher com company, I mean, to be honest with you, having done publishing myself, it is easier when you use a publishing name for an author. Rather than the author set up the signings, it's obviously easier for someone from the company to mm -hmm. set up the signings. Oh, yes. right. um, the coordinators want to speak with you or the events coordinators. Whereas um, if you're an author calling, oftentimes it's really difficult to set that up mm -hmm. in the bigger stores. Mm -hmm. So, True. all right. Um, who will implement each aspect of marketing? Uh, well, we just talked about that. Yes. <laughs> All right, how much time um, do we put into each project, and is the time equal? You know, what is the ratio? That's an interesting question. So, Chris, we, we know you wrote the script, and Rick, you are the one who helped create the novel. So how, how would you say the time was on, on creating the novel? Equal or... Rick? Well, Chris, I know, went through like three drafts of his screenplay, I think probably in a space of a couple of years. And, uh, you know, then I, when I took over, I was putting in, you know, my time on and off. You know, I had other things going on. And then I'd pass it back to Chris. He would proof it, go through it, make changes, corrections. So 
I think it ended up being pretty equal. Okay. I really do because it, it it's hard to say because it just would go back and forth to us and. Uh, I wouldn't know, think it would we typically. Keep track of time. Yeah, I don't think it would typically be seven years on a, a collaboration. No. So. Well, yeah, I mean, it probably depends on, on the book itself. And also how, how they came across. Like in my case, with both I helped on, they had a deadline. Well, to be honest with you, both thought they were ready to go. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And they both had to be reworked. Surprise. So, you know, y y sometimes you have to be realistic. You may say, I want this out. Here it is January and you want it out in November. But the reality of it is it may not make it. Right, so because the following March or there are too July. many things that can happen, and and plus you want to make sure it's not clumsy when you put it out there. It's better to take your time, and have it right. I mean, I actually admire the fact that they took seven years. That that in itself is amazing. Mm -hmm. That you know you you have that much discipline, mm -hmm. because I don't have. <laughs> I would have well, grown I mean, impatient I, after a year. <laughs> it, it helped because. Uh, it wasn't the only thing we were working on at the time. Right. Like I always like to work on two or three things at once. Right. So while, while it was over with Rick, I could work on the other stuff. So if I get movie deals or someone wants me to write this or that, if, if the mosaic was with Rick and he was in good hands, I could work on that stuff. If we sat down and worked together, like we probably could bang it out a lot faster. But I think stories take time to, to grow and mature. Mm -hmm. Well, and like you said, in your case, it, it wasn't the end all for you. It wasn't something that has to be out right away. You right. went into it with a different mindset because you write scripts, you know, movie scripts. And so it wasn't like the novel is that important. I mean, it is important, obviously, but the point is, is that it wasn't what your practice is. You are a screenwriter. And whereas with Rick, it wasn't Rick's book initially, so Rick could, could take more time with it because he had his own work he was working on. Yeah. So that all makes sense, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, what kind of pace does each of us want to work at, and how will that work? So what is a pace normally for you, Lance? Uh, it just depends on how how fast you want to get that out there. Is it is it pressing? Like we do, we will set up. Uh, we do several anthologies, and so there does have to be a deadline okay. because those stories have to be in. They have to be edited, and if they needed to be re reworked, then there you've got to put that into your time frame so that you get your book out on time. Uh, as far as personally, it's it's up to you. Unless you, unless you have a publisher that is saying we need this book by November twentieth, you have to have it. You have to have it done. So, and you know that's what's changed in the industry too. By the way, um, when I set out to to write the first book, I'll give you a copy before you leave. My first novel, um, I had a deadline because you you had to set your your you had to set up with the printer in advance. Because they're so busy back then, they were so busy. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't that many independent publishers, so their main work was with the main publishers. So they would work you into their schedule based on what time that they had available. And if, let's say, for instance, the closer you got to the end of the year, the less likely you would have of getting your book in line. So when they had time available, you had to schedule that. So now you had to make sure that you had your editing almost done, your graphic artwork done. Um, and so putting all that all together for that time frame was a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. It was a lot different than today. Today, yeah. if you're self-publishing in particular, you can take your time. You know, we all think that it has to be out tomorrow. But the reality of it is, guess what? You're going to get just as much response a month from now as you would tomorrow. You know, it's better to take your time and get it right than it is to rush it out there and then have someone do a bad review of it and say, oh. If only I had just waited. There is a, the flip side to that. Okay. Some people do need that pressure. Okay. They need it because they're not disciplined to do it. But if they know they have a deadline, they'll get it done. Are you it, talking it, to me? It is, <laughs> well, I'm not pointing the finger, but uh, if, the, if the shoe fits. Yeah, yeah. It, it seems to. And, and there's others that edit their book over and over and over again because... They don't have that deadline, and the problem with that is, is they may not ever get that book out at all. Right. We talked about that last show. I think yeah. about how you can, you know, you can work on it too much. You have to find a stopping point, right. you know. 
Yes, um, I, actually, Jeff Depew that you you've had on the show. Yeah, that is his that is his thing. He'll he'll work on it. Going, I really think I should. Do you think I should rework this scene? Rework this? I said, Jeff, just leave it alone. You you, you have to. He stop actually at said some that. Point. Yeah, you have to stop yeah, at yeah. some point and just say, okay, that's it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, does one person bring more expertise, credentials, connections, or other benefits to the project? Is there a way to measure that? Well, sort of. That is true, because <laughs> Rick knows you. <laughs> You're his brother. Mm -hmm. So he brought that to the, to the table and the fact that you are a publisher. So, Chris, did you know that when you um, asked Rick to help you with the book? Oh, no. No? Uh, I was just I was looking for someone with novel experience, really, that was interested in and understood the story, really. And uh, actually... My view is if you put something good out there and you properly promote it, people, you know, will like it. But so, when... It, but Rick, you, at the time, I don't even if when Chris contacted you, I don't think um, thirteen thirty was even no, no. the company yet. So that no. yeah, so that didn't happen. Yeah. But I think if you were collaborating, it probably would help if you had a few connections, though. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. To okay. know, so, mm -hmm. if I could just insert in here, you have to keep in mind when we started this, it was two thousand nine, uh -huh. and self publishing, you know, as we know it today, was just in its infancy, just getting started. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there was there was that. Things were changing, and in the space of just a couple of years, things were changing very, very rapidly out there. Actually, that's a good point on the question we just asked, because it would have been more important back then to have credentials or expertise or connections than it is today, because today you really don't need those connections, per se. If you want to put the book out yourself, you can go do it yourself. You really don't need anyone else. Right. You can create your own company, get your own ISBN, publish it on CreateSpace, Lulu, wherever. Yes, can. So, and many do. Yeah. So that's where the industry has changed. And what are the anticipated expenses, including editing, proofreading, design, publishing, if self-publishing, and marketing? That varies, too. Oh, it does. You it know. does. It's all over the board on that. And you want, you want of course, you want... You want the, the way I, the way the I look at board. it is, is, is that, I mean, you want to invest what you feel the value of it is. Yeah. So I see people, they go and slap together some cheap Photoshop covers. They edit it themselves. So it means that they don't really value their work that much. So my view is, I'm like, look, we're going to get an ex we're going to get an expert that can design the cover right. We're going to have a real... You know, editor, luckily enough that we have Rick. But uh, yeah. <laughs> if you, and what I've learned in the filmmaking, even when, you know, it's a team sport, so everyone has to do it, but if one part of it fails, like the sound is bad, your audience doesn't care that all the other stuff is great. Right. So, so put all your best foot forward. Yeah. And, you know, the cost on all those things can vary. Yeah, and, and I... When it comes to the audio, we have a lot of problems with audio, it seems yeah. like. But I am I do my best. I'm mm -hmm. Jan can tell you I'm a real stickler in trying to make the show sound as good as possible. And I think that's the same way you have to be with a book, you know. I made mistakes. I made so many mistakes when I started out. I mean huge. Everything you can say that can go wrong went wrong. And going in the wrong directions as far as choosing choosing editors, and I mean editors. <laughs> Yeah. Um, like in plural, <laughs> in plural, because you know you really don't know where to turn, and and you no. you'll have someone edit it. You have to pay them, and then you get it, and you read it, and thinking, oh my gosh, I think I did better. So then you'll go hire another editor, and you'll have them do it, and then they'll say, well, we need to do this again, and they'll charge you again. I mean, it's really difficult right. to know who to turn to and who really knows what they're doing. Unfortunately, it's true. It yeah. really is. Mm -hmm. well, it's kind of like giving somebody uh, keys to a car and say, I know you don't know how to drive yet because you've never driven before, just like you've never written a book before, but here are the keys. Take it for a drive. Yeah. That's what it amounts to. <laughs> uh, and who will pay for the expenses or how will you divide them? And we talked about that the last show. It's You guys have worked it out to where you have a contract. You know that Rick's going to be on the East Coast. Chris is going to be on the West Coast. And by the way, they're not in the studio today. Um, they were last week, but they both had to go home. <laughs> Yeah. They have a real family and <laughs> real responsibilities. <laughs> real um, so, you know, expenses, you know, I think you have to be very 
careful with expenses. We just mentioned a while ago, especially when you're doing book signings, I'm one of those who I like to be pragmatic in that if you set up a signing with a, a Barnes & Noble, for instance, and you're out of town, I believe you should try and set up a, an, another signing on either the Friday, because usually they're on Saturday, either a Friday or a Sunday, with a consignment shop. So you're bringing in income that way, you know. Right. Um, I mean, I'm very practical in that sense, you know. Don't just go a thousand miles for one signing. Um, you actually did that last week with with this book. You mm-hmm. both you did two signings in one day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we were going to do another signing on Sunday, but we did your radio show instead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Very, <laughs> that was very good, much. Chris. Yeah, 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 Chris. Just throw that in there. <laughs> um, and what, what would be a fair distribution of royalties? Um, what do you, each of you want? And what feels fair is based on the answers above? And that's really something that you have to work out with a collaborator. And I think we talked, we touched on that last week as well. Like, is it sixty forty? Is it fifty fifty? Um, you know, and, and you got to understand, Chris, I know you wrote the script, so you were the creator, but the reality is Rick also helped write the book, so it's different from a script to a book. So I'm sure you guys probably worked something out that was of equal value. Hello? Right, right. We, we, we do the 50-50 split because, I, you know, feel we were both, you know, investing in it, and ultimately I wanted that we both feel, you know, that we're – Giving the same value out of it to promote it. I wouldn't think anyone would want to cut anybody out unless they were, you know, simply not really involved that much. Right. Then maybe you give a lot more to the person that's putting, you know, the heavy lifting into it. I definitely wouldn't say that someone that just came up with the idea would get more than the person that's doing the real writing. So, yeah, I thought a 50 50 was a, a fair split between us. All right, we're going to hurry this up a little bit because we're running out of time already. Um, who owns the intellectual property to this? We both do. Okay, great. By copy, by copyright, if yeah. your name is, if you if you worked on it equally, in fact, that's what the copyright law says. Unless you specifically have a contract that states otherwise, by default, you're equal partners. Interesting, right. Rick. And that's where the, the the contract comes into play. So we put in the details on, you know, that the books are split and then, you know, how, you know, like with my, with the uh, pieces of the mosaic, how that's all under my name because that's what I did. But then how, how we would do anything going forward that might be different from those books. It's all laid out there and that's what you, that's what you really need to do to, to make sure everyone understands, you know, where they stand. I had a very valuable lesson I learned a couple of years ago on a book that I actually wrote. And what happened was someone came to me with an idea. So I thought, well, and he said, you can take it and run with it if you want. And I thought, no, that's not fair. It's your idea. So I basically, I, well, I actually wrote the book. But I thought it's only fair that he get a percentage. So we based on, you know, I asked him what would be a fair percentage that when we go out there and sell it. In order to do that, we put his name on the book. I learned that if you put someone's name on the book, even if they didn't write the book, if you go to register it, you have to register it under both names. Uh. You can't register it under just the author's name, the one who wrote it. It has to be both names. So that one's still in limbo, but <laughs> more than likely, um, we're probably just going to have to go ahead and copyright it in both names. There's a lot of legality in that because then they could come back and say, well, I helped write that book. I mean, so that's why it it's been, hasn't been put back on, on the shelf for two years. We had it out there, and we had to pull it back off. So it's always good to do your homework before you do due diligence before you do anything. <laughs> All right. If you want to use the content in other ventures, um, let's say teleseminars, webinars, speaking courses, how will you develop – these other ventures and how will those ventures be structured? And Rick, I know you you've done seminars, right? Um, not recently, but but you have. But I have. Yeah. So, is there anything that you would use in what you've done to um, from what you both did together that you would think about using in a seminar? Um. If I were talking, I mean, the only thing I've really done recently would be like, you know, like maybe at a convention where I was part of a, you know, a panel or giving a, a talk or something like that on that. But uh, 
you know, I just freely use anything that I've done and any examples when people ask of it. You know, as long as my name is on something equally, then I'm free to use it. Yeah. Well, we're running out of time already. <laughs> so I would like to thank our guests, Lance um, Taubel, Chris mm-hmm. Keaton, and Rick Taubel, along with my co-host, Janet Corsi. And Lance, where can we learn more about your books again? Uh, you can go into Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, or the 1330 Books website. And Rick? Um, you can see him on my website, uh, ricktobble.com. Uh, everything's out there. All right. And I also have a blog that's Right Well, Right to Sell. Um, if you just Google that, uh, you'll find me out on that blog, too, that I do weekly. Okay. And Chris? Uh, my website's chris-keaton.com, or you can uh, just find me on Amazon. Okay. Well, you can find the video of this show on YouTube.com. At, that's YouTube.com forward slash Aspects of Writing, all one word. Or go to our website at AspectsOfWriting.com. There you will find links to our, syndic- our syndicated show on iHeartRadio. Um, you will also find links to Roku TV, AMFM247.com, and 14 terrestrial stations. I think I said 16 last time. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's mm-hmm. actually 14. <laughs> In addition, we archive all of our shows on the Aspects of Writing website. So until next week, this is your host, James Kelly, reminding you, if you can dream it, you can write it. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess we're going to get started. Is everyone ready? Yes. I'm ready. Okay. Let me just set myself up here. <clears throat> All right. Did anyone watch the show, by the way, Rick? Did you see it? Yes. Yeah, we, I watched it. Uh, my wife listened to it and uh-huh. on her Kindle and real good. And Chris, you said you listened to half of it? Yeah, I listened to uh, enough of it, so... Uh... It wasn't quite as uh, irritating to hear myself as I thought. <laughs> you guys are so critical of yourself. I'm the same way. I, I truly am. Uh, I'm, I'm very critical of myself. Yes. So, yeah. You Jan has to tell me every day. Every single time we talk, I say, I'll call him and say, that was a fantastic show. Really, you think so? <laughs> yes, James. I loved it. Really? What would you like about it? It was so informative. Insecurity. Oh, it, yeah, that's God. what it is. It's insecurity. Mm-hmm. All right. If we're ready, here we go. Ready.